Um, yes, we can. <laughs> I hope our you listeners don't zone out as much as you do. <laughs> you froze on my screen. Oh, really? That is more that reason than me okay. zoning out. Because <laughs> it's sort of like you finish cows. talking and it's like this. <laughs> I'm like, shit, <laughs> that's not a good sign. <laughs> oh, welcome to the 21st century and shitty internet reception. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pleasure of the Text podcast, a shared imaginary space where readers and writers make meaning together. We are your hosts, Shannon and Gareth. Good morning, Shannon. Well done on getting through the introduction. It's always a bit... Um... You are most welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad I don't have to do it. Uh, I know you've asked me to do it a few times and I've just refused and that's why I don't have to do it. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a thing, isn't it? I'm just, I'm always amazed. It's like you're an actor you know, doing the first monologue of a play. Uh, I suppose the play is after that just ad lib. So it's one of those plays you don't want to go to. But, um, but yeah, what a great introduction on this fine and sunny Sunday day. Well, thank you. <laughs> I don't think anyone would ever pick me as becoming an actor because I'm terrible. I've got a monotone voice and no monotonous voice. Um, and what else were they going to say? Oh, you've, you've forgotten your lines. I have. <laughs> uh, uh. Um, oh, I was going to say in um, professional podcasts, just like our own, what they normally do is they have a set introduction uh, and then they just plug it in and then they have the introductions of a guest or something. And I actually do it every time. So every you time it it's every slightly time. different. Slightly different. I, mm-hmm. We could do a supercut. I think that would be uh, that would be interesting. Uh, a supercut also of, of when I come in because as you're doing it, I think, what am I going to say? No idea what I'm going to say first up. Um, and yeah, the it's, are it's not ticking away. Oh, you can hear them. I should put my head closer to the microphone because it's just clock, <laughs> clock. Yeah, it's pretty slow. <laughs> clock. Um, so last time uh, we, we reviewed um, Mariana Enrique's Our Share of Night, which uh, I suppose, given our uh, score for it, you would describe as a book recommendation. We also, uh, and I, li- I like to think that our listeners um, see us as, as friends, of, of a sort at least, um, perhaps you know one that they like and the other that they tolerate. I'll leave the the rest of it up to your imagination. The decision up to you. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, um, there was also, we talked about a, a book review that um, was particularly galling, uh, which you could say, you know, it was an anti-recommendation, I suppose. Again, from a friend, because I, I assume Guardian reviewers, we, we read those as, as we would a friend's remarks. Um, and so you hit on the idea that we should talk about the – the science or the art, I'm not sure which it is, of giving good or bad book recommendations, ones we've had from friends, uh, but possibly also other sources, just in case we don't have a lot of examples of the former. Uh, Would that be a reasonable summary of what we're doing this morning? That is a very good summary, and it's meant to be a fun, lighthearted podcast today for this beautiful Sunday. And... I suppose I thought about this because I recently got a book recommendation. So when you go to someone's house and they ask you what you do, you know, that typical hierarchical question that comes up and I give them the usual spill of my day job, but then I get very excited about what I actually think my job is, which is I'm a writer. And then they say, oh, my second cousin married to my something or rather wrote a book. And (laughs) then they give me a physical copy signed of this book. Please read this book and tell me what you think about it. Um, And I never read these books. Uh, Maybe I should one day. Maybe I'll find a masterpiece. (laughs) You might. But, um, But anyway, so from that experience, which happened a couple of weeks ago, I thought about all my friends 
and their good intentions. And some of the recommendations I've had have been fantastic. Uh, Gareth, you are being spotlighted here. And some of them have been uh, subpar or a bogey if I was playing golf. Wait, is a bogey a good golf score? I don't know. No, it's not. We could um, even go double bogey or then you just go three over, four over. That's where we get into the Gareth territory. Um, Just a quick question. Um, Are your friends listening to this podcast? I mean, (laughs) what is your strategy here? I'm going to be naming and shaming people here. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to be naming and shaming. I think we should use fake names. (laughs) If you like, I can contrive the names for you as my contribution. Gerard. Gertrude. Yeah, sure. I'm going to do a lot of G's. Gareth. Oh, that's a spelling error. So, um, okay, so you're not going to read that book, but it's it's in plastic, so it's well preserved. The plastic mm-hmm. actually does remind me of a it body bag. Like, uh, and for a memoir where one goes does, through hell. It does, enough, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Actually, if you were doing a true crime book, sticking it in a body bag uh, you know, you zip it open and take the true crime book out. <laughs> that would out. be like, great marketing. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. And you Give should scatter the them in body the bags. bookshop with um, chalk drawn around it, a chalk circle. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the hilarious. the price tag could be on a little toe tag thing as opposed to a sticker. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a whole thing, folks. Goodness. We're, yeah, in the I, wrong, um, we're in the wrong area, Gareth. We should be in marketing. Well, mayhaps, although, of course, we are looking at publishing, so maybe it's not all going to be wasted. I have all kinds of stunts. Um, so, okay, so so give us another, uh, give us a good one to start with, perhaps, just to, you know, get off on the right footing. What was a good okay. book recommendation? Okay, I'll start with you, seeing as I did say I was going to name and shame, and we can, we can change your name to Gertrude if you want. I am Gertrude, yes. A good one. Yeah, you okay, do my bad so, ones later. Uh, Bill Canto by Anne Patchett. Mm. Um, I absolutely adored this book. I wish I could write like her, and I sometimes uh, imagine that I am mirroring her writing. It is incredibly beautiful, one of the most romantic love stories I've ever read without um, the over-the-top sex or anything like that. It's just really warm and fuzzy romantic in this uh, situation where um, gorillas come into the house and they take people hostage. And it's just a great concept that love can happen in such a environment. So therefore, based on that recommendation, I've started to read another one of her books. So she's now one of my favorite authors and this is the state of wonder. And I think she's released another book out recently, which I've seen in the airport uh, but I can't quite remember what that one's called. But highly, oh, yeah, there is this a was a very one. good recommendation, Gareth. Well, yes, and 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 so I mean, I guess that's the best kind of recommendation, isn't it? If it makes you not only read the book that was recommended, but then you move on to other books that are uh, connected in whatever way. That book actually, I suppose, was a book recommendation to me. Uh, and it was from mm. uh, because it was recommended. Uh, it was. Uh, a selection for uh, my book club. Um, the the way we run the book club is we let people pick books rather than just telling them what they're going to read, uh, which which seems a bit grim. Uh, and, and you know we have the rule that um, it's generally literary fiction, um, but beyond that, people throw at you whatever grabs their fancy, and um, that was one of those books. Uh, and, uh, I don't recall actually who recommended it, but I, uh, I was so thrilled. It was one of the, the high, it's been one of the highlights for me of being in the book club was discovering that book through a, a, fr- a friendly you recommendation. Other and patch it? You know, I haven't, I bought a bucket load, um, but they're just on that my ever growing list of unread books, uh, and of course the oh, other one, which I think I've it. mentioned, was William Boyd's Any Human Heart, uh, which was recommended oh, by I was Paul grab that from one the bring book it up. club. Hello, Paul. And uh, I did not like the look of that book. I read the back and went mm, like that. One of those old man grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but very quickly it won me over and I was like, my God, this is a great book. It was so clever. 
And it was incredibly commercial writing in a lot of ways. Um, I assume it was a bestseller. It should be because it's uh, it, it it kind of works on both a, a a literary and a popular level. It's an easy book to read, but it's a book that gets your brain bouncing off in all kinds of directions. Um, uh, so yeah, and they were the two. So obviously, I have recommended on this podcast and many other spaces any human heart by William Boyd and Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. You may hear me doing it at a party, if we're ever at the same party. Someone will be stuck in a corner, they'll be looking for a way out, and I'll just be telling them about these two books that I found out <laughs> about. Yeah. So and obviously you're one of those people, Shannon. No one gets away without being told about Bel yeah. Canto. Have well, you actually done the have you passed the favor? So was... Oh yeah, I have. Um I was saying before we jumped on, I give my book recommendations very seriously. And there was a couple of people at work. She said she liked a bit of romance, um, but a lit- literary fiction. Handed the book to her and she loved it. And she was working with someone else and he liked Russian authors. So I recommended um, Nikolai Golga. Um, Golga, yeah. Who but, the man, uh, Diary the of a Madman. Uh, yeah, was it that one? Yes, uh, but he has a collection of short stories and he also enjoyed that. I sell an also Tolstoy. Um, it's not War and Peace, it's the other one. That was part of your book club recommendations. I'm going something blank. I know Ilyich we did read it. What was it? Oh, well, Shannon's doing The a Death of, of Ivan Illich. Oh, that's right. It was that one. Yeah. There was some interesting stuff about the translation of that book, which um, we may pick up in a couple of weeks, couple, no, well, a couple of podcasts time. Uh, well, I was saying now that we're on the topic of Gertrude or Gareth, we've just covered all the good recommendations. Oh, um, Haruki Murakami, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle. Yes. So this is probably the worst book recommendation you've given me. And I'm not going to harp on about Haruki Murakami because I did do that in another podcast. But imagine the scene. Gareth and I went to this beautiful cafe with his lovely wife. And I think I had uh, Eggs Benedict. You could see the lake, the water glistening, and I love going to cafes, actually, that they have a book swap library, and we found this book and Gareth recommended it. Even though I'm not a fan of Haruki Murakami, I can say I have prolifically read him because I've read about five others of his books trying to figure out what the deal is, and I just couldn't. I just couldn't. It's fascinating so to me because you like so Kobo Abe and I feel like they have an enormous amount. They're like writing cousins almost. Mm. Uh, it, it's such an interesting thing, isn't it? And, and um, later in this episode, uh, I'm going to refer to this sort of um, idea of the sort of the um, ungraspable bit that comes into book recommendations that, that it can't be reduced to an algorithm. Uh, the wind up bird chronicle would, I guess, go on my list of suggestions, um, that, that I have had. Um, but what, what I think, so I was saying to you before we started Shannon that I don't get a lot of book suggestions. Um, people, people don't recommend things to me that much, um, outside of nonfiction sort of things. Uh, so most of my book suggestions are more than suggestions because they're presents. People have bought them for you. And, uh, and at that point it's a little harder to kind of go, Hmm, that's a nice recommendation and then forget it because it kind of sits there and stares at you. And there's a certain, uh, good manners, I think in, in reading books that are bought for you. So, uh, yeah, my wife gave me, um, my wife Jane gave me uh, the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. She was particularly struck. The um, the, the front cover has a cat uh, walking across the um, the front, and its its tail is hooked in the way one of our cat's tails is hooked. So that that hooked her, and she read the back and went, "This sounds like something my husband would enjoy." Uh, and so she bought it for me, and. Um, and I did enjoy it. I enjoyed it very, very much and then started recommending it to other people um, with mixed results, it seems. 
Um, so, yeah, and I'm I am genuinely uh, surprised that you don't like Murakami because of other things you like, and I think that's a, a really fascinating aspect of all this. Um, the, the, there is something a little bit um, inscrutable about what it is people find in books. Uh, and it's quite glorious that there's a sort of a, just a, an ungraspable element. Um, who's that other famous Japanese author that we really love that we recently did a review? I don't know uh, why. Yoko Ogawa? Like, no, wait, brain we, is yeah, no, we point. did. Yoko Ogawa. Yoko Ogawa. She, yeah. She also has a lot of Kobo Abe in her. And I'm just thinking maybe I should venture, if I am brave enough, uh, into some of Murakami's short stories because I think one of my biggest gripe, if I think about authors that do have some Kobo Abe element in them, are very short and economical, whereas I don't find Haruki Murakami to be that. It's the complete opposite. If I had my editor's scalpel, I would cut that book into a quarter. Yeah, I liked how secure this it was, but I mean, this is, it's, I, I yeah, I think we're just going to have to agree to disagree on that one. Um, I, I don't think you'll like his short stories. Um, I don't particularly like okay. his short stories, although having said that, that may be exactly the thing. Might I mean, you, you might find in them something I'm not seeing and the, the, that I find in the novels and that you don't. So it's possible, but they are, they are fairly, they're certainly not um, plot driven pieces, his short stories. Uh, they feel almost as though they're creative nonfiction sort of feel about some of them. Uh, certainly the, the selections I've read okay. of his stuff. Um but it would be a, it would be very interesting to hear your take because you might be short stories. He is the master of short stories, and I'll be like, "What?" Uh, and that would be that would be really interesting. <laughs> oh, maybe I should do that as a joke on one of the podcasts just to see that face again. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, what else have you got? What else? Okay, we have uh, one of Luke's best friends that lives on the island with us. He's given me – he is very surprising, actually. I did not think he would be into literature as much as he is, but he tells the story about how when he grew up with his parents, they weren't allowed to play video games or any type of games unless they're going outside to play because it was seen as a waste of time. And that thought process has come through into the books that he reads. So he only reads um, Man Booker winners or whatever winners there are because as much as he enjoys reading, it's still, if I'm not reading a good book, it's a waste of time. And his first book recommendation to me was 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Now, you can see my uh, bookmark in there. It's probably one-fifth of the way through. I have enjoyed this book, but I feel like this book has to be read in one or two sit downs over a weekend because I come back to it. I'm like, oh, I'm not quite sure what's happening because it's very time meandering. You uh, start off with the villagers and then stuff happens and then, then they're all grown up and there's cousins and children and children marrying children. Um, I want to say that this was a good book recommendation I just haven't read it the right way that it should have been read and I would like to reread this again. Then the other one that he has sitting in his room and he says he loves, but I can't say it is a good or bad book recommendation yet because I haven't fully read it, but we did this uh, a while ago where we compared Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code to a classmate of his, David Foster Wallace, Infinite Jest. Now I have read snippets of this book, and it might be the same situation where it has to be read in a particular sitting, but I don't get it. So far, I just don't get it. But I haven't read it. I've only read snippets. What are your thoughts on that? And the writing's so small. Yeah. It's a and big it's book, a isn't it? 1,000. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I guess David Foster Wallace, um, at a certain point, a decision was made that that he was the, the sort of wonder kid of American letters. And I actually, I don't think that did him any favors um, because it, it, it kind of, uh, DFW, we'll call him. It's sort of, it, it's like a stamp or a, a mark on his work that, that, that sort of gets in the way of one's ability to access the work. Like, you, you, you know, if you're going to read Infinite Jest, it's a masterpiece. Uh, you remember we've talked about this. It's a masterpiece. And so you're constantly reading it against that, that word, uh, and, and I think that really yeah, I agree with that. problematizes it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's another book that's on my to-do list, um, but it keeps getting pushed back uh, largely for this reason. I, I find myself thinking, am I in the right headspace? I'm not going to read it twice, probably, at 1,100 pages. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, it's sort of, uh, I, I don't think it did him any favors the, the way he was fated, um, at the time. And, you know, and also I, I think there's a small cottage industry now in saying he's not that good, uh, which tends to happen as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I wish you luck on that one. Uh, and if you, if it is indeed a book recommendation, I will take it seriously and, and get on and read it. Um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. You got more or should I should I talk about my Wait, two? <laughs> I have two. Should I? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You can go ahead. I've got another three, four, five, another ten to go. Keep going, I say. Don't worry about me. I don't have much okay. to offer. So this one was actually a university recommended book. I did a creative writing course down at the University of Newcastle. And even though I would say that the teacher and the course ruined any confidence that I thought I had in my writing abilities, one of the benefit was this book that they made us. Burial mm-hmm. Rights by Hannah Kent. She is an Australian author and this book, it took my breath away. I was, I'm always very opposed to university recommended books. I don't know why. I don't know if it's that authority um, because I've always read books even since I was a very little girl. Just someone telling me you have to read this book and you have to say something about it. I mean, we talk about the books that we're going to read and I trust your recommendations every time. Um, even when you've had a one slip up, maybe two. But this one was beautiful. I'll read the blurb. Northern Iceland, 1829, a woman condemned to death for murdering her lover, a family forced to take her in, a priest tasks with absolving her. But all is not as it seems and time is running out. Winter is coming and with it the execution date. Only she can know the truth. This is Agnes's story. It's based on uh, a true story that happened in Northern Iceland and she does a fantastic job of using symbolism. There's a a crow in the story from memory and this crow is really important and just the way that the story unravels is very compelling. And I'm not sure, maybe someone has said that it reminds them of Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace if we would have to give it a comparison. But... Very good book. I, I've also recommended this to Luke's mum and she enjoyed it as well. Would you and recommend it to me? Author, which I don't normally. I don't know. That's a very good question. I'm going to leave that with you. Uh, yes. You I think I would. Because it sounds interesting. Yes. Okay. I will. Uh, I would recommend this to you. I will seek out a copy. Or you can just come visit. Yeah, well, I could do that too. Oh, actually, um, seek out a copy. One of my favorite things to do is, you know, those book swap places? Um, They're hidden in cafes on street corners. I Most of my collection has come from there, and I've got another two. I might as well go on. This I found in a cafe in Wingham, which is near Tari, Mm -hmm. just in the mid-coast of New South Wales. Yes. Um, 
you recommended uh, Margaret Atwood to me to help with my writing. And since then, I've been collecting all of her books. Even though I haven't read this one yet, um, Margaret Atwood, again, is now one of my favorite authors because of your recommendation. And then another one. This one came highly recommended by society in general. It was a huge hype up. And I was like, okay, found it in the um, book swap little thing next to our cafe on Coochie Mudlow, Before the Coffee Gets Cold. Ah. I don't know if you've seen this one floating around. A good friend of mine is reading it's it right very now. very popular. Yeah. Um, okay. I hated it. Oh. I was about to say it, it seems to get good <laughs> word of mouth, but, well, Tell us more. <laughs> Why did you hate it? So it's by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. I'll be very political and say what you said where it was just a bad book for me. Compared to the other Japanese authors that I've written, uh, read, sorry, this one was very basic and blasé. The structure didn't work to pull the effect that I think the author was trying to achieve together. Um, so the story goes in a small back alley in Tokyo, there is a cafe. The purpose is you can go back to the past, but you have to come back once your coffee gets cold, otherwise you're stuck there as a ghost. And you can't change anything in the past, but you can resolve feelings or emotions. Um, I'm sorry, I just have to jump in because I know you have a coffee past. cup warmer. You yeah. Tell, yes. Could you break the rules? Yeah, I was, it immediately jumped into my head. You could time travel for eternity because you got this fantastic coffee cup warmer from Acme, I'm just saying. And if they want to, uh, you know, support our podcast with, you know, oodles of cash, we will absolutely endorse their product. <laughs> Back to our regular programming. <laughs> I, I just found this was very lacking in a – the concept was brilliant. I just think it lacked in the execution, lacked in imagination, and the characters were lacking as well. I found very little distinction between the three characters that kind of go through this process. And I feel like it just needed maybe another edit or something. It just lacked magic to me. So after that, did you want to mention up one of yours? <clears throat> yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I really only have one. I mean, really. Um, so I don't know if it's because I've always been a reader and maybe a, a loud reader going on about books to people that generally people don't give me book recommendations. Um, I'm not used to getting them. And I haven't really thought about it until you suggested this podcast topic, to be honest. But when I really started racking my brain, I was like, God, no one ever really recommends any books to me particularly. So, I mean, when I, and when I say books, I mean fiction books because I've had a lot of uh, nonfiction books um, recommended to me. And I typically don't read them because I don't read a lot of nonfiction. Uh, but it has a lot less to do with the the quality of the recommendation and, and more about my sense that I, I, you know, if I have time to read, I should be reading fiction, which I feel is the truer form. Um, so, so in my life, I've had two books recommended to me dozens and dozens of times. Uh, and the first one is the Bible, uh, the Christian Bible, uh, which I read eventually um, really. So I could say I've read it and I, I kind of felt that would, that would sort of answer uh, a, a, any sort of lingering worries from the people who were recommending it to me. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it's not a great book for me. Um, I, I think it has some great moments. The song of Solomon is, 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 is glorious, but, 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 but really, you know, I think when we recommend books to people, we hope they're going to have a, almost an epiphany where they're going to be like, you know, the way, the way it, it, it excites you, you hope that it will, excite others and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't i think i i think the bible falls into the exact same space for me um it just it just didn't excite me um but i have read it so no one needs to worry that i'm unprepared for hell uh and indeed i i hear there's a book that takes you on a tender and shimmering journey through hell so uh i could always <laughs> give that one a go as well yeah <laughs> um, the other book is harry potter um 
And it's hard to explain, uh, you know, because Shannon, we have we have a few years between us in age. It's very difficult to explain the experience of being an adult reader when Harry Potter took off. Uh, sorry, an, an avid adult reader or an adult reader. What would it be? An avid reader as an adult. Um, because because people, <laughs> it was an epiphany for people. People read it and went, you know, people who'd never read books before were saying, I love books. I love Harry Potter. And that was th- thrilling to me. I, I, I thought it was so exciting that, um, you know, kids were reading books with their parents and, and, and they were getting into it. And it was uh, multi-generational. And, uh, yeah, I was, I, and I still am all for it. Like I, I have no bad feelings towards Harry Potter. I've realized that my bad feelings are adjacent to it in the sense that I, I don't know how many more times I can have someone tell me, uh, if I haven't read Harry Potter, I haven't really read yet. Uh, you know, which is an alarming idea. Um, and I actually, I was thinking about, so what happened when I was, when it was first recommended to me? Um, it was recommended to me by one of my students you know, in a creative writing class. And uh, sh- she was a very good writer, or in fact, still is a very good writer. Hello, Frida. Um, and uh, she recommended this book to me. And I thought, well, she knows what she's talking about. So I went into a bookstore and I picked it up and I, and I read the back and I thought, hmm. And then I thought, well, you know, open the book up <laughs> at a random page and just read a bit. And uh, I didn't want to do it from the first page because I thought I'll give it a better shot if I start somewhere else. And I, uh, and I actually remember the page I read because I, uh, I, I quickly found myself a copy for this podcast and did a, a word search because I recall letter bombs featuring. Uh, and I'm, I just want to read you a tiny bit of it. Harry went to get the post. Three things lay on the doormat. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, who was holidaying on the Isle of Wight. A brown envelope that looked like a bill and a letter for Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart twanging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he'd never even got rude notes asking for the books back. Yet here it was, a letter, addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. There was no stamp. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing, checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. Now, I've I've skipped a few bits here and there, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually very well written. But it feels pitched at a kid to me. And as a, I believe I was in my 20s at that point, uh, it just seemed like a very strange suggestion. I read on, they're having a fight about the letter, the uncle's holding the letter over Harry's head and waving it about. And it seems like the sort of thing a child would love. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I think that um, – I do think that perhaps adults loving Harry Potter, you know, finding it as adults, maybe liked how nostalgic the text is and how it captures a certain kind of puff and books quality. Um, but yeah, I read it without, and, 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 you know, I have no sense that, um, these are badly written books at all. I suspect they're very well written books, uh, but not for me. Um, but weirdly what happened at that period in time is if you said that people would go, no, you're not reading it right. Go back again. I mean, this is possibly the best book that's ever been written. And I was like looking at it and thinking, I mean, I don't know that that's true. Uh, and it was a very strange experience and people were quite zealous. It was um, almost like something you'd imagine in a sci-fi uh, novel where everyone's, you know, they're reading the book. And when they read the book, it's like they're not quite there anymore. They've become pods and they want you to read the book so that you can join us on the other side. And so, you know, I, I, I really want to stress that I, I don't think that people who like Harry Potter 
uh, uh, making a bad choice in doing so. But I do think that it's possible that as I get older, um, children's literature might appeal to me more and that may be a time for me to read it. But it isn't that time now. And, and it's amazing how many people have over the years been quite hardcore about their disappointment in my not reading Harry Potter and, and uh, the idea that I don't really love books because I haven't read Harry Potter. Uh, I, I literally had someone say to me once, it's the best book ever written. I've really only ever read one book and it's the best book ever written. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can't really oh, argue gosh. with that. But um, there was a, a lovely, I think it's lovely, but – um, if you're a very devout Harry Potter fan, and I've already offended you this far, perhaps turn off for the next minute or so. Um, Stuart Lee, the comedian, uh, has a show, Stuart Lee's Comedy Vehicle, uh, or he had that show. Great show, a bunch of stand-up acts. Um, and I really like Stuart Lee. And uh, I'm pretty sure we're not allowed to play the clip, uh, but he does a piece on books, Um Episode one of season one of Stuart Lee's Comedy Vehicle. If you want to go and search that out, I highly recommend it. But I thought I'd read you this bit because for me, it captured everything I've always felt about being a non-Harry Potter reader. And so he says, the world of publishing is in crisis. Publishers sell hot titles at massive discounts to supermarkets, driving independent publishers out of business. I remember when the last Harry Potter title came out. I think it was Harry Potter and the Crock of Shit. Remember that? Or Harry Potter and the Mitten of Wool. Or Harry Potter and the Stick of Wood. Or Harry Potter and the Forest of Embarrassment. Anyway, I was in Tesco's and they were literally delivering the new Harry Potter books on forklift trucks, on pallets into the supermarket. Get your books, pile up the books, get a multi-pack of books. Why not take an extra book home, put it in the freezer? So those, those Harry Potter books, you know they're for children, don't you? They're aimed at children. People do that to me. They say, have you read the new Harry Potter books, Stu? It's good. Have you read it? No, I haven't read it because I'm a 40-year-old man. You should read it, Stu. It's about a wizard in a school. I'm not reading it. I'm a grown-up. I'm an adult. Have you read Harry Potter, Stu? Harry Potter and the, the Tree of Nothing? No, I haven't. I haven't read it. But I have read the complete works of the romantic poet and visionary William Blake. So fuck off. And <laughs> that for me... <laughs> That for me captures how I feel about it, I suppose. <laughs> I think, yeah, I'm all for Harry Potter. I don't know about Harry Potter fanatics, though. So that's um, that's a book I, I haven't been willing to read, and, and it may be that I'm so opposed to the concept now I never will get to read it. I do have a question for you, Gareth, because I was thinking the other day. So we do uh, book reviews and we read a very – wide range of literature yeah. how is what we read and what we do when we discuss books different to your experience doing a d degree in english literature do you think the degree was necessary for you uh gosh that's a hell of a question um it wasn't necessary Sorry, for this podcast. I thought it would just be an easy one. No, no, that's a really that's a really complicated question it definitely wasn't necessary for this podcast <laughs> Um, I found, uh, I actually loved university reading lists, um, because whilst there were many books that I was a bit meh on, uh, it introduced me to a whole bunch of different writers. I might never have discovered on my own. They were too far outside the sort of the tree that I have with its various branches forking out. There were whole other trees virtually. Uh, so I, you know, uh, I remember it, uh, I went to Macquarie University and there was a, a course, the European novel. And I, my wife actually was in that class. Uh, this was our first uh, interaction with each other, I suppose. She was not impressed by me because um, there'd be a new book to read every, every week. Some were thin, some were very th thick. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The First Circle, which is a massive book was one one week's reading. I read all the books 
uh, and I loved all the books. That was a great course for me. Uh, and pretty much the rest of the class didn't read the books, uh, inclu- including my wife, Joan, who, who would glare at me uh, throughout the whole tutorial because I'd just <laughs> sit and talk to the teacher. She basically gave up on the others because uh, I hadn't read it and so there was no discussion to be had. So she and I would just sort of have a cosy chat in the corner while everyone sat there and uh, there were no mobile phones back then, uh, or at least the ones that you wouldn't play on them. Um or more like remote control. So you just have to do a doodle in your notepad. Yeah, or glare at me. Uh, and certainly my earliest memories of my <laughs> wife are her glaring at me. Uh, it hasn't changed that much. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I found that a very helpful experience and obviously that led into uh, further studies specifically around creative writing theory. So I suppose in a broad sense, yes, it's been, it's been very helpful. Um. I think that you and I don't have the kind of authority that a university course has. I think it would be very fair and reasonable for people to hear anything we have to say and go, no. And I I would think that's a perfectly reasonable response (laughs) to whatever we might have to say. So, you know, uh, I think it's quite a different thing. Uh, um, you know, I suppose I would imagine myself as being something like the Harry Potter fanatic going, oh, you should read this book. This is amazing. Why haven't you read this book? Uh, and, and, and a listener might well feel a degree of irritation from time to time. And I, I think that's very reasonable. I endorse that feeling. Um, whereas, yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and obviously with university stuff, you fall into the, the question of the canonical. And, and all the problems with the idea of a canon and how does one create a canon. And indeed, uh, when I was thinking about this podcast, I thought, you know, what I need to do is find a book, a dictionary of literary influence. Uh, so I Googled it. Uh, this would be the perfect book. So you just find an author and it says who they were influenced by. And because, you know, obviously, if you like uh, Mariana Enrique, she talks quite a bit about Silvana. Ocampo. So you might move on to her work. Um, though she has some problems with his, with him as a person, she talks a lot about Borgay. Um, and so you might move on to his work. And, and likewise, we've talked about, um, you know, Abe and uh, the influence of Kafka on him. And so you might give Kafka a go if you like Abe. And so, and so it is. So I thought a dictionary of literary influences would be a brilliant idea. And there is one. (laughs) It's called the Dictionary of Literary Influences. Uh, And the the one that's relevant, in my opinion, because I'm not that interested in um, 19th century literature, or certainly not as interested as I am in 20th and 21st century literature. So there's a volume that goes from 1914 to 2000, but it is very, it's, it's a pretty select list. Um, and it, it's very much of the West and of the English speaking West. So immediately uh, a lot of what I would consider to be useful material has been left off the table. Um, nevertheless, if you can find yourself a copy, it's quite interesting. Um, and certainly down the track, I hope somebody actually does one that's a bit more comprehensive, maybe one that, you know, every year um, it gets revised and adds more stuff in. Um, but, yeah, so uh, I've got <clears> – <throat> I managed to find a sneaky extract of this dictionary online. Uh, and one of the featured pages uh, is Ray Bradbury, um, author of Fahrenheit. 451, The Martian Chronicles, and so forth. Uh, I'm not going to read this to you because it's um, it's quite long. It talks about his career, and it just sort of mentions things that he said in interviews, and I think, I think this is a point to remember. Uh, so he sort of says that Edgar Allan Poe was a big, uh, big one for me when I was eight, Buck Rogers at nine, Tarzan at ten, and so forth. He, he references um, Charles Dickens, H.P. Lovecraft, Sinclair Lewis, uh, Sherwood Anderson. 
and and certainly you can sort of see these um you, you can see these influences in his work uh edith wharton uh i could go on if you're a fan of bradbury these names are probably not a massive shock to you but in general you know it's a, it's a for a big book it doesn't include that many writers actually because it deals with other people um famous figures and someone like bob dylan for example um or apparently gandhi because he's on the cover uh so you know it's something uh and i think when you read author interviews they'll often talk about their influences and so you know if you're thinking about you know you have someone who says well i love this book and you're you're trying to come up with a recommendation that would please them uh, looking at what the author says about their influences would seem to be a pretty good place to start. Uh, but there is no official book of this thing, which would be a wonderful thing. There is Goodreads, of course, but Goodreads is problematic. Oh, in so many ways. So many ways, with all the review bombing and and also just the concept of reducing all these things to, to an extent to an algorithm. Uh, because obviously you can read the reviews, but the the data therein is sort of compiled and built into into code, so that we can all know what we like. But I don't think it necessarily works out because there is something intangible. That was the word I was desperately looking for earlier: the intangible quality of a book recommendation. So you can see I'm 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 working my way around this question because I don't have a big list, but should we get back to your list? You mentioned that you don't read nonfiction. Not a lot. Uh, no. But I do. Uh, a book that I read, uh, is it already April already? So I can't remember if I read it at the start of this year or towards the end of last year. Uh, 101 Essays That Will Change the Way You Think by Brianna Vest. Patrick, our good friend who has been on this podcast before, recommended this to me and also bought me my very own copy. And that, as the title describes, there are 101 essays in this. And the two that made the book for me are the first two. Subconscious behaviours that are keeping you from having the life you want, a very good essay, and The Psychology of Daily Routine. Um, some of these essays are, are hit and miss, but the ones that are a hit are incredibly powerful. So that was a really good recommendation from Patrick. Another one. Uh, so mid last year, we had I had a friend staying with us from America called Aiden, and he is very big into chess. And so he was teaching me how to play chess, and he bought this book for me, how to reassess your chess great use of rhyme i uh, yeah so i've been reading through this and it's got pictures um this is why i love nonfiction because you learn some incredible stuff uh that you don't necessarily always get from fiction i mean fiction has the ability to teach you empathy um definitely because i think we've talked about that in another podcast but i don't think i've ever read a book that's taught me chess um what else are they going to say in that? Oh, and I remember listening to a podcast ages ago, and Tim Ferriss is one of my favorite podcasters. Uh, we're second to him on the list, should be soon anyway, because he is a top performer. I think he's number one on all the listening platforms. Uh, but he was interviewing a polymath, and I can't remember his name, but he developed a – you were talking about the – process of how do you come up with book recommendations mm. and he didn't know how to do it so he just developed an algorithm put a whole bunch of titles into this algorithm and it would spit out a book every time he was ready to read one and that was how he covered a whole breadth of a different type of literature from all the different regions of the world as well as inserting some non-fiction as well and that's how he kept his polymath brain active and hungry for more and i think that was a really cool idea yeah i I think it has some merit. I'm skeptical because of the intangible element that, that we will discuss more because I have an excellent um, 
I have an excellent article about this. I also just quickly want to show you a book, Shannon, uh, and, our, and our viewers. Yes. Uh, this, it weighs a ton. A thousand and one books you must read before you die. Um, it's uh, it's really heavy book. And again, you know, a thousand and one, like a hundred and one. It's an odd thing that we do, isn't it? We just add that extra thing. You don't have a thousand books. It's always a thousand and one. If anyone knows why that occurs, what the origin of adding the one on is, I'd be fascinated to hear about that. Uh, But even with a thousand and one books and more than 500 color images, uh, this is not anywhere near an exhaustive list. But but if you did want to, um, if if you felt like you were looking for some book recommendations, I, I think you could do a lot worse than picking up this book. Um, it's quite an attractive book. It has the, what's that? Did I just open up on Radcliffe Hall? What are, what are the chances? Oh, um, no way. But yes, it has, uh, it has some lovely, <laughs> I'm trying to land on the yellow page. Don't know what that is. Pippi. Yes. <laughs> Pippi. If you haven't is read Pippi, book? uh, you haven't read books. Uh, you're not really a reader if you haven't read this book. Oh, God. Uh, mm, yeah. So this is a good one, though, I think, if you're if you're looking for general book recommendations. Um, and it's a, probably an excellent book uh, to buy as a gift uh, because, you know, there's got to be okay. something in there for everyone, doesn't there? Like 1,001 books. Mm. <laughs> Have you read the whole list in there? Goodness, no. I have. Uh, it, it's a coffee table book. It's it's one of those books where you pick it up, you kind of open in a random spot and have a read. And if it pleases you enough, you might read another random spot. And so you sort of bounce around the book until you read a couple that you think, no, I don't like this anymore. Then you put it down and forget about it. But I, I think it's a, it's a lovely book. It was given to me as a gift. Um, and... Yeah, I, I think it's – there is certainly gr- a great number of books in this uh, collection of 1001 that I'd never heard of uh, and some that um, I'd heard of but knew almost nothing else about. And it, it has certainly uh, given me food for thought and sort of encouraged me to pick up a few different authors here and there. I might I might read you a tiny bit of um, my last bit of material that I have for the uh, this episode – and it's a it's a lit hub um, article. Lit hub's an interesting beast. Sometimes I read it and feel quite dismayed. Other times I uh, I'm very pleased by what I read, which I guess is a sign of a good publication. You wouldn't want to be pleasing you all the time. And and you know, I guess one of the issues with platforms like Goodreads is that it is algorithm driven, and it is designed like all social media to start hitting you with things that you want to see and, and, and thereby perhaps limiting your horizons, arguably, or in fact, I think definitely. Uh, so this author, um, Oh, Maris Kriesman. I hope that I hope I've done a decent job of that pronunciation. The article's entitled for book recommendations. People are always better than algorithms. Uh, and so obviously I was drawn to this. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but I think I, I really liked um, the first paragraph. Uh, and she writes, the best kinds of books are the ones with attributes that are unquantifiable, which is a big reason why people are so much better at recommendations than algorithms are. There are so many different things to like or dislike about a work, special qualities that go beyond plot and setting and genre that can't be revealed from metadata voice, tone, philosophical outlook. What is unquantifiable is is horrifying to the corporate overlords, of course, but it's the magic that connects readers with particular books. Maurice uh, describes herself as a semi-professional book recommender. Um, And so she actually has a a pretty interesting kind of list for questions and the kinds of responses she will give. And I think... Yeah, I, I tend to think that the general uh, idea is that, uh, quite, well, yeah, 
So, so her basic agenda in the way that she um, recommends books is as follows, quote, my goal is to challenge the person who wants a recommendation while also being sure to give them what they want. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of the thing, isn't it? Like you, a bad recommendation could almost be a good recommendation. The two, the two things, there's a, there's a hair's width between them. Uh, and I, I feel that with, you know, recommending Kopo Abe to you and Murakami, uh, I, I, I would have said that if you liked one, you'd have to like the other, but, but not so. Uh, and I also think that the Abe book that I particularly thought you'd enjoy was the one you liked the least. Uh, so it's, it's a very, which one was that one? Um, the ruined map. Ruined map. Oh, ruined map. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was the one I I thought you'd like the most. So, you know, it's a very fine line, but I think, you know, it's, it's, we might as well just stay on social media if we're going to recommend things that we're certain will fit, uh, you know, the recommendees reading profile that it won't sort of push the needle at all. Just be very safe choice. If you like this, you will like this. Whereas I think you, you're, you're trying for something slightly beyond that, I think. Uh, I recall when I was younger, someone gave me a, um, uh, a CD, because they were a thing at one time, of the Saints, uh, the, the Australian <laughs> band. And, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's punk, punk rock, uh, very, very early punk rock. And I hadn't really listened to punk rock. And I listened to this, and I loved it. Uh, and I was quite surprised because it didn't sound like anything else I, I had well, that I was listening to musically. And so suddenly another doorway was opened. So, yeah, I think, I think, I think my basic point is you can't be afraid of a bad recommendation because you're never going to be 100% sure. Uh, and, and obviously when you recommend for friends, you, you do have some sense of what they like. So you're just trying to find that, that very narrow aperture where you can let in a tiny bit of light that perhaps hasn't been seen before. And hopefully that works out. I would agree with that. Yeah. So that's what, that's what I came away with. And I think a lot of the book recommendations and you have given me have been on the edge of the precipice of that hair piece that you mentioned. And a lot of them have brought in extra light into my reading repertoire And I'm very curious in the questions that this lady uses uh, for her to be a semi-professional book recommender. Is that in the article? Yeah. So, for example, um, okay, so a a common question is novels to get lost in but that are still smart. And she says, and and so so that's what she was asked for. And then her next category is what I think they mean by this. And she's saying um, this is her most asked for category. And she thinks these folks are looking for literary fiction with a strongly constructed plot. So lively yet still immaculately written, the holy grail of big, fat, juicy novels. She then puts down her current recommendations and follows that up with some all-time favorites. And she's got, I think, seven categories uh, as part of this article which i yeah i uh i I strongly recommend it's a it's a really interesting article and uh she mentions a whole bunch of yeah i'll do that so yes so do you have more shannon and now with this extra information about algorithms and the intangible how will this influence what you say next who knows let's find out a lot of the book recommendations you give me, Gareth, and I'm just going to end on you because you're the ones who reckons me, recommends most of the books to me, but it's mostly to help me. It's not I'm going on a holiday and I need a juicy book with a smart and very specific plot. It's very specifically to help me with my writing. Yeah. And one of the ones you have recommended to me is Pale Fire 
by Vladimir Nabokov. Mm-hmm. I have not read it yet, but did you want to give a breakdown on this book and why you recommended it to me? Well, honestly, I can't remember why I recommended it to you. Do you remember why I recommended it to you? Because it would have been around a particular uh, concept. Well, I do. It is the the unreliable narrator. Ah, well, yes, it's kind of the apotheosis of that. Um, yeah, it's 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 basically uh, a, a book about commentary around a poem. So, so there was a, a poet who wrote a poem, and it, it's a little bit like a House of Leaves in a way. Uh, the The majority of the book is commentary about the poem by a person who maybe doesn't really know about the poem and might be quite mad. Um, and so it's, it's quite a, it's a very, I suppose you would say it's a very postmodern piece of writing. Um, but it, it, it's focus is on unreliable narration. So, and Nabokov is, is, is fascinating anyway, because he's such a narrative writer, um, by which I mean, he, was a fan of narration and for dramatization. Um, or to put it another way, he was a great believer in telling and not showing um, uh, and was quite bolshy about it. Uh, so, yeah, that would have been, I think that would have been my thinking there. Uh, well, the recommendation came up after we finished our review on The House of Leaves and <laughs> there you go. we also recommended Blind Assassin mm-hmm. yep. by Margaret Atwood. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this book you recommended to me was also gifted to you by your sister. Mm. And you, uh, this is one of your one and only favorite fantasy novels, Earthsea. No, I um, no, alas, no. <laughs> um, oh, I mean, man. yes, yes, it is. It is absolutely. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. Um, well, might you say, but isn't it written for children? And I would respond, no. Uh, it's it's very much an all ages piece of writing, uh, and and indeed, you know, I think I've probably mentioned before, I don't like young adult as a concept. Uh, it's it strikes me as extremely weird um, because, yeah, I mean, kids can read adult fiction. You know, obviously, it's subject matter depending, but. Uh, yeah, I, so Earthsea, uh, my sister has in, indeed given me some good recommendations over the years. Um, but Earthsea, I actually was introduced to at school. It was a prescribed book. Uh, I think I was in primary school. I'm not really sure. It, it would have been late primary school, or possibly early high school, but I, I assume it was primary school. And yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's uh, an incredible book. Um, and much like uh, Christopher Lee, the actor Christopher Lee, uh, he would read uh, The Lord of the Rings every Christmas. It was sort of his gift to himself. He absolutely loved that book and, and was in the Peter Jackson film version of it. Um, I tend to do that, not quite as fanatically. As Sauron. Yes, yes, he was. Uh, and yeah, I'm not as no Saruman. S- Saruman, yeah, the uh, the mage. The um, I have read the 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 main trilogy of Earthsea, uh, books one to three. I would have read them at least a dozen times, which is you know a lot. Uh, because there's a lot of books in the world to read and one, one can't be getting too stuck. But there is something about those books that um, that really always grabs me and, and that I find that I get grabbed in different ways as I get older. So that is probably all of my book recommendations, but I am going to show this one because our next podcast, we are going to be talking about it. Solaris mm. by Stanislaw Lem. This is another author and a book recommendation you have given me, Gareth, and I have finished the first book of our two-book part homework of Solaris, the two translations. I must say at this stage I did not find a lot of humour in the direct translation from Polish to English, 
And I'm now going on to the translation by Joanna Kilmartin and Steve Cox. The other one was by Bill Johnson. Uh, so we'll see the ver- differences. I've already noticed there is quite a significant number of differences even in the first uh, two sentences of the first page. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And that was a very good book recommendation. Um So go out and buy your copy, everyone, because we will be reviewing Solaris on our next podcast. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty stunning book. And uh, I think we were also talking about all the film versions and the Polish TV version and so much to get through for the next, next, next episode. (laughs) Well, yeah, I, um, I also think that, you know, I mean, Shannon, Shannon, I think, has probably brought more to this podcast than I have, it must be said. Uh, And so I think, you know, listeners, if you're looking for book recommendations, put in a comment. And Shannon, (laughs) I'm putting all this work on you, Shannon, but I think think you're the right one to do it. Shannon will come back with a recommendation. And it would be fascinating. Uh, You can also rope me in if you want. But um, it would be fascinating, actually, if if that could happen and people read some of the recommendations, gave us feedback and told us whether, you know, we managed to recommend something useful or not. That could be a fascinating follow-up to this episode. So send in your questions. Yeah, and and we'll see what happens. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to people's comments and giving out book reviews because I do take this very seriously. And um, until then, I still have a lot of reading to do and a lot of movie watching to be ready for our next podcast, which is going to be about Solaris. So until next time, everyone, uh, we'll see you later at the pleasure of the text. Bye for now.